Hi, um, I'm Scott Jones. I'm, I'm director of the Electronic Frontiers Forms track at DragonCon. I'm also acting director of Electronic Frontiers Georgia. I think we've got the signs for both of them up here. And so, um, uh, yeah, we'll be talking a little bit about Electronic Frontiers Georgia today. Um, I apologize if I feel, if I sound a little draggy, I am dealing with some post-COVID syndrome, so I will do the best I can, but uh, uh, again, uh, let me pass, uh, uh, my pronouns are he, him, I'm going to pass it over to Ali, and uh, have, have you introduce yourself. Sure, hey, I'm Alejandro, oh, I don't know if I've got sound now. Uh, oh, there we go, awesome. Cool, hi, I'm Alejandro Ruiz Esparza, I use they them pronouns, and I'm a co-director for Lucy Parsons Labs. Uh, Lucy Parsons Labs is an organization based in Chicago that was founded in 2016 and started as a collaborative between technologists and transparency activists um, whose name focuses or pays homage to the 19th century Chicago radical labor organizer and agitator. We focus primarily on the role technology plays in creating harm in our society and challenge it through research and investigation, uh, public education efforts, and also litigation. Um, apart from that, I'm also an organizer with Chicago's campaign to cancel the shot spotter contract, which at this time has been endorsed by over 50 community organizations and over 3,000 individual community members. Um, so I'm delighted to be here at DragonCon. This is actually my first time in Atlanta. I've been having a blast. Um, and I'm excited to speak to you all here with Scott uh, about gunshot detect detection systems and surveillance at large. Okay, I want to back out and talk a little bit about uh, government surveillance generally. Um, right now, the, the, there is a government surveillance industry, and the industry is in a bubble. And the reason why it's in a bubble is COVID relief money, Build Back Better, infrastructure bill, all this spending um, is uh, they're just uh, money uh, kind of like blasting out of Washington out of a fire hose. And the vendors see this. And they're all like, how can I get a piece of this? I mean, it, that's uh, just uh, kind of only natural. And the only thing I, I will say about, you know, all federal spending plans eventually come to an end. So, you know, you have to think a little bit down the road and think about, uh, you know, what it looks like now, but what it also is going to look like down the road. But definitely, it just in general, the entire industry is in a bubble right now because of the spending. I also want to say that uh, Electronic Frontiers Georgia is not an organization that wants to defund police or is anti-police as an organization that realizes that police have a job to do. We want to see um, funding for hiring, training, uh, you know, legitimate things that they need to do, uh, uniforms, squad cars, things like that. Uh, we don't argue with that, and we think that there are very good things coming out of the spending bills, but uh, the problem is that with some of these technology solutions, they're just rubber stamping everything. They're not really uh, making any real critical decisions, no critical decision making about which are good, which are bad, which are helpful to the community, which are hurtful. And in some ways, we're making some of the same mistakes that we made back in the 1990s with the Clinton crime bill. So I, I'm afraid that we're making some of these mistakes over again because there's such an outcry about crime after the, the pandemic and, and we're throwing everything we got at it and we're not stopping to think about what makes sense and, and what doesn't make sense. Um, I just wanted to, to start off with that. Um, now I'm going to move into the gunshot detection and there's several companies out there with solutions but uh, there's one uh, company that has 98-99% of the market and that company is called ShotSpotter. And so uh, we have or had a shot spotter system here in Atlanta, and there's a shot spotter system that I know of in Macon and also in Savannah. And that those uh, sm uh, systems in smaller cities, I do not think they would be possible without the, the, the federal funding. So that's, that's played a big role in it. Um, it's uh, spreading across the country, and in fact, it was here in Atlanta in 2017, and we had some quiet conversations with our um, elected officials. And uh, after some thought, and I don't know how much of a role we played, but we, uh, you know, they kind of decided that it wasn't worth um, it wasn't worth the money they were spending on it, and they were going to shut down the system. And then it kind of came roaring back to life with another. Um, another trial and another evaluation. The latest uh, iteration was a three-month trial, but I've talked to my city council person, and she is telling me that the trial is not going to go forward uh, beyond the trial. So 
we have a lot of concerns about the system, um, and, uh, and you know, I think our concerns are being addressed in Atlanta. I don't know that they're being heard in, in Macon and Savannah and other cities across the nation where this system is expanding. Um, I want to uh, throw it over to you, Allie, and if you could uh, tell us a little bit about ShotSpotter, about what it's supposed to do, sure, yeah. and what it actually does, and, and, and kind of how it's supposed to work, and 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 what we're what we're finding out about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, before going into that, I, I will say that Lucy Parsons Labs is an abolitionist org, so we do want to defund the police and. We'll probably feel a bit of tension, maybe every now and then, um, a little playful tension here and there. Um, I, I, I'm, at, I'm just out of fruit throwing range. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I'm sitting over here. Um, but ShotSpotter. So ShotSpotter is a surveillance tech corporation that sells auditory surveillance hardware and software that they allege can detect when gunshots have been fired. Uh, normally, what happens is in the event of a signal being sent out by their system, uh, the police officers from some sort of a uh, from the local police departments, uh, deploy officers to a determined site based on the uh, location of the initial signal. Um, there isn't any real independently assessed evidence to back up their claims that they can, for one, detect any sound that is a gunshot and discriminate it from any other loud noises, firecrackers, uh, cars backing up, um, any other things that make very loud, uh, quick sounds. Um, and there's also a growing body of evidence that instead suggests the technology is faulty and ineffective at best or exceptionally dangerous at worst. Uh, the systems, as I mentioned, they can be fooled by some of these other loud noises. Uh, ShotSpotter as a company doesn't, uh, hasn't tested the tech for false alerts. Um, if you're someone in data analytics, you know, you might think of type 1 and type 2 errors. Those sorts of things aren't provided by them. ROC curves, another fancy word that data people like to use, none of that's been provided. Um, and when there has been any semblance of research that seems to confirm ShotSpotter as being efficient, uh, it's usually paid for by ShotSpotter. Um, so you should always take that with a grain of salt, always look into who's paying for research. Um, in general, there, there really isn't anything that is out there that's been peer-reviewed and independently done to check their system out. Um, we do know a lot of facts in Chicago, um, and that's where I'll be speaking to mostly just because I'm from there. Um, so, for example, 89% of shot spotter deployments did not turn up any gun related any evidence of a gun related incident, so it's just nothing. Uh, less than 5% of alerts led police to a shooting or an attempted shooting, and on an average day, there are over 61 dead end shot spotter initiated deployments that turn up no evidence of a crime. Um, and as you might imagine, this can have some uniquely uh, awful consequences on anyone who happens to be in a region that has now been designated to be a area where a gunplay has been found. Uh, you see police officers come in um, and start stopping and frisking people who have been in the region. Uh, people have been incarcerated on false charges, uh, which I can speak to a little bit later too. Um, yeah, and at least in Chicago, what we've seen is there is a pattern of placing these devices primarily in just black and brown neighborhoods. 80% uh, of Chicago's black residents are in uh, are within the sort of uh, dragnet of shot spotter. 63% of Chicago's Latinx residents are as well, myself included. Uh, my family included, um, and it's just all kind of spiraled out of control. It started with a $33 million closed-door contract that the public wasn't subject to um, being able to know it was happening, there's no transparency. Uh, it got refunded not that long ago, and we now have had over $40 million spent uh, on taxpayer money on this device um, and the system. And in general, uh, there are other sorts of concerns that come out of this. Um, I'm sure Scott can speak to some of the privacy concerns that we've had uh, when it comes to shot spotter. Um, yeah, and yeah, I mean, I guess I'll turn it over to you, to you Scott, in case you want to talk about that, for starters. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, with, with respect to um, privacy, I, I, I think maybe more in the terms of Fourth Amendment than privacy as much. I mean, this is a system that is uh, has microphones that are that are spread throughout um, a particular area or a particular neighborhood, and the microphones are always on and they're basically always recording. However, from a constitution, you know, again, I'm not a lawyer, but from a constitutional standpoint, it's not unconstitutional. It's not illegal to um, put uh, recording devices out on the street and record. Um, so, I, you know, that, that's not a constitutional problem in and of itself. However, this, is, this system is doing more than just recording. It's uh, 
reporting, and also in real time it's triangulating. It's using some, it's, there's a claim of some kind of technology um, to identify the nature of the sound, and it's dispatching police in real time or near real time based on, uh, I guess it's dispatching to a call center or something like that. And then that, uh, the call center evaluates it and then dispatches police. And so, again, I'm not a lawyer. I would say that, yes, it's legal to, to, to make recordings on a public street. Um, but at the same time, it sounds like what they're doing is somewhat transformational. That I think you've got an argument there where you could say that this goes a little bit beyond just recording. Um, can you bring that back to me? And it goes a little bit beyond, beyond just the recording. It's, it, what it's doing is pretty transformational, and it is, uh, it is uh, calling the police directly. So I think maybe there's an argument there that that may be a constitutional problem, whereas just simply recording on the street wouldn't be a constitutional problem. Um, the other issue is the Fourth Amendment, and the Fourth Amendment is basically saying, uh, you know, the police need to get a warrant before they, they do searches. And, one of the, the one of the things we're seeing kind of in the digital age is um, police are, are working with uh, private parties, uh, private entities where the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply. Um, so they'll go to the private industry. They'll go to a private industry. They'll get uh, information about a suspect from private industry without a warrant, and then they'll come back in with a warrant to justify it to make it look justified in the court. And so it's this Fourth Amendment bypass. And, and you know, if you're, say, for example, that you're a UPS driver um, driving down the street, you happen to witness a crime and you call it in, that's not what we're really worried about. Um, you know, you witness a crime, that's no big deal. But a system like ShotSpotter, they've got a dedicated terminal in the police office. And in fact, the police that are out in the field, they have a mobile app. And so they're really kind of joined at the hip and they're acting as if they were police. Uh, or an extension of the police department um, when they're not, and they're bypassing the Fourth Amendment. So they're effectively doing searches without a warrant, and then the police come back in with the warrant. So there you've got um, the Fourth Amendment bypass. And so you've got privacy, you've got the privacy issue, um, you've also got the Fourth Amendment issue, and together, um, yeah, I, I, I think they're problematic. Um, now, I'm not, again, I'm not the lawyer, and uh, it's hard to say what today's court system would do with it. Um, it, it. There's been a lot, obviously, there's been a lot of changes in the courts the past couple of years. But I think that just in terms of, of our values and what we value as a country, there's really a problem there. And it's something that we really need to ask ourselves, uh, is this what we really want for a system like this? And I think uh, a lot of it's problematic. Yeah, and well, and to uh, Scott's point, um, recently this past month in Chicago, uh, our organization, Lucy Parsons Labs, uh, filed a class action federal lawsuit against the city, um, alleging that the Chicago police misused this unreliable gunshot detection technology in a, ma in a manner that violates uh, equal protection for black and brown people in the city. Um, we're seeking damages for individuals who are already directly affected by ShotSpotter. Um, and again, I'll speak to that in a bit. Um, and in general, uh, we're also uh, alleging that the city's decision to place most of its gunshot detection centers in predominantly black and Latino neighborhoods is racially discriminatory. Um, but in, in terms of the cases I was uh, referencing before, um, so in, in the past year, uh, there was a man in Chicago named Michael Williams who was uh, 63 years old uh, when he spent nearly a year in our Cook County jail after CPD officers falsely accused him of murder based solely on an unreliable shot spotter alert. So what had happened was an alert went out um, and the police arrested him, but uh, later on what was found was that it was never an alert to begin with. Uh, police had actually talked to shot spotter engineers and had asked for a uh, location to be reclassified as having had an alert and then used that to arrest him instead. Um, where he sat in, in there for 11 months, uh, he caught COVID twice, you know, has a tremor. Uh, he's a plaintiff on our case as well. Um, later on, uh, another man named Dennis Ortiz was just doing his kid's laundry when he was illegally stopped, frisked, handcuffed, interrogated, and arrested outside of the laundromat following an unfounded shot spotter alert. Uh, he also spent a night in jail before charges were dismissed. Um, so we're seeing patterns of this. These are just two people, right? But you might imagine that it's going to be a lot larger, and that's why we started a class action lawsuit. Uh, we're waiting for more folks to uh, join in, and we're already talking to more people. Um, 
but it's uh, it, I think if anything, it just points to the reality of the situation where there are signals that are being sent out, and without question, uh, deployments happen. People get arrested. People get stopped and frisked. Uh, the reason that our campaign started in Chicago initially um, was because uh, a young a young boy by the name of uh, Adam Toledo was murdered by the Chicago Police Department following a shot spotter deployment with his hands up. Um, and it was a really crystallizing moment for a lot of us. I, I didn't live too far from where that happened. Um, I've seen the shot spotter device itself many times because I pass it on the way to work. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's really made us uh, viscerally understand that these systems that are, are put in place in communities under the skies of public safety frequently don't provide any safety. They, they give you an excuse, right? And I mean, it, you know, to giving, giving the benefit of the doubt to um, local policymakers, you know, people on city council and so forth, there are understandably issues of crime, there are understandably issues of violence and poverty and so forth. Uh, but rather than really trying to dig into the roots of it and what's causing it, what's causing it to continue across time, it's far easier to just buy a, some sort of a software package and then just say you fix the problem, right? And so we're seeing this tendency. The ShotSpotter isn't the only company doing this sort of thing. Um, there are other companies we can talk about today, too, uh, some of which I'm sure many of you have heard of. Um, and if anything, it's just pointing to this larger market that's also you know, coming out because it, people aren't looking for good solutions, they're just looking for easy ones. <coughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Stop. Go with that. All right. Uh, yeah, I, I'll, let me talk a little bit about surveillance capitalism as a, as a general term. We hear the term surveillance capitalism um, uh, used for, um, in a broader sense, um, that's used for companies that are I'm um, kind of digging into your privacy, maybe for marketing reasons or for you know um, engagement, things like that. They're basically doing things to 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 track you and and maybe even to influence your behavior a bit and uh, try to to, to uh, push you into buying things. But that's not all there is to surveillance capitalism. Uh, an increasing um, amount of the surveillance capitalism industry is feeding the needs of government. And a lot of that is feeding the needs of, of law enforcement. So I think what we're seeing over time is, is, is virtually all the surveillance capitalism in the early days was about marketing, it was about engagement, things like that. But the slice of the pie that, that's, that's um, going toward government is, is increasing um, to be uh, greater and greater. And I'm afraid it's, it's headed to the point where it's going to be over 50% someday. And um, that, that is very concerning to me. So um, the other thing is I saw a story in the Wall Street Journal that came out this week. Um, it shows that advertisers pay a premium of 268% for behavioral tracking. They spend a lot of money on behavioral tracking to track what you do. And they get, a, out of that 268%, they only get a 4% return in increased sales. So there's a dramatic difference between what um, what the companies are paying and, and the, the benefit that they're getting. And that's because um, there was so much excitement about this technology that could track everyone. Uh, nobody ever sat down to rationalize it. Nobody ever sat down to, to ask, are we getting our money's worth? And I think that phase is coming. And so as you see more and more companies uh, and obviously that's going to let, a, financially speaking, it's going to let a lot of air out of the tires for companies like Google and Facebook and uh, uh, you know, other companies that, uh, social media companies, technology companies that depend on tracking for, um, you know, for their revenue. Um, and you know, and I, I see it coming where there's going to be kind of a crash and burn on, on this uh, um, privatized uh, tracking, behavioral tracking. And when um, companies are experiencing a shortfall in their revenue, I think they're going to switch over to government. So again, um, I see the slice of the pie um, for government tracking increasing, and probably very soon the slice of the pie for the private market decreasing. And so that's uh, very concerning. Uh, we're hearing a lot of, right now about privacy bills and privacy legislation in Congress um, to protect our privacy from so-called big tech. But I'm afraid there's a double standard out there. The government wants to crack down on big tech a lot, but doesn't want to crack down on its own use of this data. 
And so you know, I, I believe, you know, I'm very concerned that there is a double standard and that we're going to see um, more and more of this um, uh, data sales and growth in data sales directly to government from private sources. And that is very troubling. And so I, the, the time to stand up and, and register your concern about this is now. Uh, I, I see it only increasing and I see that a market that was um, driven, that was a, a very much privatized market dealing with the private industry is, is quickly shifting over to government industry. So this, the, the, the situations that we have with ShotSpotter and other players in this field, it's only going to increase. So it's something that you've really got to track and pay attention to. Mm -hmm. I want to also talk a bit about just the entrenchment of uh, social issues due to placing and deploying these devices um, in, you know, using a racial justice lens in predominantly black and brown neighborhoods. Um, in particular, our social surveillance systems at large, they have this tendency of interest, entrenching these social conditions further um, because it, it follows almost this, this feedback loop or this sort of circular logic. Uh, in Chicago, it was this Chicago Police Department that said that they'd used historical data in order to uh, determine where they should place these devices. Um, but he, as you might imagine, historical data that's been produced in a racist context leads to sites of deployment, which then create more data in those same sites and justify further carceral violence. Uh, so it creates this very vicious cycle where you end up just creating, um, almost fabricating more and more data for, and using that to justify these sorts of actions and just uh, regions that have been a priori decided as, as being criminal or criminalized. Um, because incarceration, or at least in, okay, we don't believe incarceration can change systemic issues, uh, but instead pushes them deeper, uh, we end up with these digital systems that just continuously produce punitive actions, punishment, and further criminalizing these uh, regions and the people within them, or the people who pass through them. Um, I think uh, there's, a, there's a scholar, Wendy Hugh Kyung Chun, who had said, if uh, the captured and curated past is racist and sexist, these algorithms and models will not only oh, will only be verified as correct if they make sexist and racist predictions. There's no real room for producing a future where this isn't a, isn't the the case. Um, the idea of efficacy when looking at these models just sort of relies on more of the same, right? Uh, so, like, if you expect something to be bad, you think it's work your system's working well, if you keep seeing things that says it's bad, and that doesn't really let you have a chance to recover. It doesn't really let the people have any sort of autonomy for moving forward. Um, but what it does do is it amplifies existing uh, racialized anxieties um, using this idea of safety as a guise to continue using or developing out um, these policies that produce uh, massive amounts of spending on, on these really shitty products, to be honest. Um, I guess I can give you a bit of a story. When I was a kid, I used to have friends uh, not come over and visit me because they thought my neighborhood was really dangerous. Um, I lived in a predominantly Latinx neighborhood. Uh, and that was really hurtful, right? But I, I think um, the irony of that is I had my parents say the same things about other communities, and I had to really do that work to educate them and, and like have these discussions of understanding why this sort of sentiment isn't, isn't productive. It's not rooted in any evidence. Um, but what it does do is it lets you say, hey, let's not go there because that's where all the bad people live, right? And so when you have that sort of rhetoric already established, uh, you end up just seeing more companies um, and uh, you know, agents like uh, the police departments uh, use that to say, these people can't be trusted. They need to be watched. They need to be surveilled. Um, we think surveillance is nothing more than a show of power and domination for the communities that are under it. Uh, and you know, as Scott was saying, this is something that needs to stop. Um, I don't think it's something that's only only harming black and brown people, but I do think it's uniquely harming them today. Um, or rather us, I should say, today. Uh, and regardless, when you have these systems set up, if you pass through it, you know, you're at risk too. If one of those signals goes off, then you might have a bunch of cops suddenly show up and start asking you questions or put you in a position that's really dangerous and you might not even know why. Yeah, I want to point out that uh, there are alternatives. Um, to these kinds of uh, very tech-heavy solutions that, that, that sort of obscure the real problems in our communities. And one of the examples I learned about this year is something called Cure Violence Global. And Cure Violence Global is a program that uh, treats violence more with a disease model than a, like a medical condition, uh, than necessarily just strictly a societal problem or something that, that the problem that we just accept it and can't be dealt with. Um, uh, the cure violence model uses 
um, uh, people that who are known as violence interrupters. They serve as kind of a layer between the community and the, and the police. And what they do is they build relationships with people in the community. Um, they have probably, an, I would say, an additional layer of trust that you don't always find with the police. And uh, they, they learn, you know, kind of who's in the neighborhood, where the problems are, and they do what they can uh, to, to prevent violence. They literally do work with people to kind of prevent violence and alleviate situations before they boil over into gunplay and, and, and gunfire. And you can't um, necessarily prevent everything that way, but you can really prevent a lot of things that way. Um, it's not the only program out there, but there's other programs like that. We've got Midnight Basketball in Atlanta. Uh, we've got uh, jobs programs. We've got other things that can kind of reach out to people and give them alternatives. Um, you know, I, I like to say that, that if you have to use the gun to win an argument, you've lost the argument, you know, if you have, uh, but, you know, if you have to use a gun to feed your family, that really is kind of everybody's problem. Um, so we really got to take, uh, another look at this and consider programs like Cure Violence Global or other programs. I know that in a lot of cases, these don't, these don't sound as sexy as artificial intelligence this, that, and the other, but when you raise the hood on, on the so-called artificial intelligence, you'll find that it's not intelligent at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we really got to, we really got to take a look at what works. And, and systems like ShotSpotter, they're not really preventing violence. Um, they're reporting on it after the fact. And you've got some, a, a program like Cure Violence Global is, is actually really going to try to interrupt it before it starts. That's true prevention. And you're not getting that with the technology system. And so um, it, you really got to rethink the, the way that you approach things. But um, a lot of times it's not the rank and file police who want a system like ShotSpotter because these systems are calling them out on all kinds of false alarms. The false alarm rate can be as high as 90%. I mean, every, every car that drives through the network <coughs> that backfires, or, you know, any sort of bang or pop in the system can be misidentified with the system. And the police get called out on a lot of false alarms, and, and they know it. And so the people that really support this a lot of times are the, the, the upper police brass, or the mayor's office, or the city council, because it makes them look like they're spending a lot of money to solve the problem. Uh, it, it's more about political expediency than really solving the problem. We're lucky we've got, I've heard that we've got an incoming... Um, uh, police commissioner that is going to be more focused on the human uh, types, the human side solutions, and not so much focused on the technology type solutions. So we're lucky in Atlanta, but we've still got a system in Macon, we've still got a system in Savannah, and obviously we've got this all, all across the country. If he's representing the, the Chicago side of the equation, I mean, it's in New York, um, it's out on the West Coast, or it's coming in on the West Coast, and is, is kind of spreading like wildfire. So we really need to get the word out that, that uh, it sounds, it may sound good at first. In fact, I thought it was really clever when I first heard about it. But once I, you know, once you lift the hood, once I heard about the details and what the problems were, um, you know, you realize that this is not really preventing anything. Um, it, it's not really helping. Um, and it's, it's just, kind of a waste of money and, and it's putting people at risk that, that don't need to be at risk. Yeah, yeah. In Chicago, we've started referring to these kinds of surveillance systems as just reactive. Um, they react to something having occurred uh, and they just create, you know, incarceration through punitive action. Um, and like what Scott said, this, this doesn't heal the underlying problem. It just, in fact, just amplifies it. It makes it worse. Um, it creates communities where people are frequently getting incarcerated. Uh, and coming back and then getting reincarcerated and coming back. Um, and I think uh, an important thing to know here too is that like, although we do have all this uh, you know, modern language around these digital processes and these technologies, uh, surveillance is, is as old as uh, policing has been in this country. This isn't anything new or different. Um, it might look different because it's uh, using computers and algorithms to some extent. Uh, but this is no different from communities also having a very heavy police presence. It's no different from being followed around uh, when you're just trying to shop and you're doing that while black or brown. Um, it's, a, it's more of the same, more than anything. Um, there's a, another term that gets 
used a lot in uh, data-based, I guess, uh, domains, and it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, and I think this is a really good example of it. I mean, you're just getting a lot of uh, bullshit data that doesn't really mean anything. It's not extracted in any way to do anything useful, and then it just creates a new problem, or there wasn't this problem before. Uh, so now where, where people have been experiencing crime, they're also going to start experiencing uh, having these very difficult and sometimes uh, violent police encounters for no reason other than a uh, system that's been connected to most of your utility poles in your city, uh, just sending people in and out. Um, in Chicago, of course, uh, I think um, one thing I, I should add too, uh, which goes along with Scott's point, is that the shot spotter alerts take pr uh, precedent over all other alerts in the system in Chicago. Um, so that has the highest priority. Uh, it will immediately send police officers out. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about uh, activism and, and activists across uh, cities across the country that have been raising concerns. Um, I mean, what has happened in the past is the activists in each city or in each state um, have been acting independently to raise concerns about the system as it's spreading across the country. And what's changed is that the activists are now starting to talk to each other. And so I think that's really good. But, uh, the, you know, if there is a downside to this, it's, it's that there's a lot of different organizations involved and they come from a lot of different backgrounds. And so there's been uh, some effort to find the common ground, and, and that has not always been easy. But, and it's a process that's ongoing even today. But, I, you know, pretty much the common ground is that none of these organizations like ShotSpotter. They all have different reasons uh, to oppose it. Um, but, uh, you know, again, it's, it's about coming up with a, finding a common ground and coming up with a common message. Um, Electronic Frontiers Georgia is part of an organization that, or I guess part of a part of an alliance that is, has been forming to raise concerns about uh, shot spotter. And if any of you out there are um, also involved in organizations that would be interested, you're welcome to talk to us. Uh, there is a vetting process, and uh, we we don't I don't think uh, the alliance has opened its doors to just anyone and everyone, but. You know, if you do have this interest, if you're sincere about it, you know, we're willing to talk to you about it because I think that the more organizations we bring on board, you know, at some point it achieves critical mass and, and I think there'll be more success down the road. Um, again, the most, it's, it's what I opened up the conversation with, but the most troubling aspect of this whole situation right now is the federal funding that's just blasting out with, with, with no real common sense being applied to where the money um, should be spent and where it shouldn't be spent. And so I think um, we had this problem before the funding started, but it's really accelerated it. And it's also attracting a lot of uh, dubious players into the field who see all this money and they figure, hey, we'll throw together a system that does the same similar thing, we'll cash in on this money. Um, and it's, so it's brought kind of new urgency to the whole, uh, to the whole field. Um, and that's kind of where we are yeah. at this point. Yeah, in Chicago, uh, this, the system has been paid for partially using ARPA funds and just COVID relief funds as well. So since it's already sort of been framed as a, a public health sort of thing, even though, you know, how, I, I'm not really sure, right? There's a lot of mental gymnastics that go around, but, yeah. It's all semantics. Question. Are we taking questions? Oh, yeah, if they want to ask a question, <laughs> Yeah, we will take questions, but please come up to the mic so we can get it uh, with with a reasonable amount of distance. But yes. Hi, I, I have two questions. I know that case in Chicago. Uh, you mentioned that police called ShotSpotter to modify what was originally reported. I believe yes. it was the location. I've also read that they will sometimes call and say, "Can you say three shots were fired instead of one?" Is there any way in our own communities that we can gather that information? Because I haven't yes. really been super successful with public records requests. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's mostly how we've done it is through public records requests. Um, what we're hoping for with our lawsuit is we'll get more information on discovery, mm -hmm. uh, which would you know be much harder to get through just a FOIA or whatever the equivalent is. Um, but um, yeah, this brings up another problem. Yeah. Public records request applies to records. public institutions, <laughs> yeah. uh, but it doesn't necessarily apply to uh, private organizations like like ShotSpotter. So, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, 
Yeah, so that there's a little bit of a blind spot, and in fact, they use their, they use some of their intellectual property rights. They use yeah. um, the uh, I guess trade secrets, which are trade secrets are supposed to protect the formula of Coke, for example, but it's not really supposed to protect um, your it's not supposed to protect your company from showing the public that you're incompetent, especially when you're in a public public service role. Um, and this is a real big problem. Uh, a lot of companies like this use trade secrecy to hide um, flaws in their product um, or maybe to deny requests for public information where there's obviously compelling public interest. So what we really need is a change in policy to say that if you're acting in the role of the police, we, we need legislation to say that, that you have some of the same obligations. You've got this. You really need to have the same obligations in terms of public discovery and public disclosure, um, with FOIA type, um, you know, discovery. Um, and you shouldn't hide be hiding defective products uh, behind uh, behind intellectual property rights. Right. That actually leads into my very next question, which is: um, they say that their the technology between their analytics is secret because it's their company. Have either of you made gains in figuring out exactly how they triangulate yeah. what happened? It's, it's probably exactly secret because it sucks. Yeah, that's a good know. I mean, yeah. that's the problem. We, we have um, gotten some documents back in FOIA uh, that, to some extent, tells you how the systems work. Uh, they use a residual neural network uh, to try to tell whether or not uh, something was a gunshot. Um, it's, it's not really the best way of approaching sound if you've ever used uh, data in this way for machine learning. Um, and But yeah, I think um, if you want to give me your email afterwards, I can send you some documents. Um, and they'll probably be much more detailed than anything I can come up in this moment. Yeah, I mean, ideally, if you were going to create a technology solution, you would have it in the you, independently verified uh, scientifically through peer review mm -hmm. and what we're seeing is that they never they never do this kind of scientific um, research and there's not any real peer review I mean really this should be kind of wide open because if it's wide open um, and the public can see it and then people have more trust in it you really need to engender trust because eventually you're going to be sitting on a jury that has to make a decision about something that came out of these systems. If this is all done in secret, then they're saying take our word for it. And I, as a, you know, if I'm on a jury, I'm going to say no. Um, and and that's another issue with juries. I think you're seeing starting to see more cases where the jurors are, are being asked to sign non-disclosure agreements because something is in the you know in the private domain and there's some kind of secret that they don't want to reveal. Um, I mean, that shouldn't really be a part of jury service, um, in my opinion. Uh, but um, uh, we're seeing it increasingly because there's more public, uh, this more this public-private uh, connection, and, and there's a lot of technology solutions out there. And sometimes they're not up to stuff, and they're they're literally hiding stuff behind um, behind their intellectual property rights. So they want to protect intellectual property. They want to protect whatever else. They might try to get a juror to, to, to sign an NDA just so they can sit and, and, and pass judgment on a criminal case, uh, or they or they hide the they hide the fact that the system was used um, and and chalk it up to something else, um, which is I what well, I forget the term for that, but um, and then we read about yeah, I can't say the word obfuscation. There you go. Well, yeah, obfuscation. There was a there was a more specific term, but um, and then you we learned you skirt if you're trying to hide how you got information, you obscure it by using an asset that is clearly more publicly available. It's it's basically reconstructing reconstructing um, the investigative process to say that that you found it through resource A, which has constitutional problems. But you chalked it up to resource B. That's not which well. That's obfuscation, but not in a legal way. That would be still illegal if ever proven. So I've been pinching my you know brow. All right, I've got 13 years active duty, three years reserve, most of that information worker, including three years with the NSA. I've got a lot of Fourth Amendment you know training. Do you want to jump up on the mic? Um, I can <laughs> I can speak loudly. So as far as no, no so. A lot of the concerns, more importantly, that you have made, to the extent that the public can be concerned about them, if you want to do some kind of additional protections, will acquire amendments to the Constitution because 
the information you've provided here today says everything that the, uh, the SHOP program is doing is 100% legal and constitutional because they are taking advantage of metadata, which no one can own, anyone can collect, and use how they see fit. So the collection mechanisms, how they use that data is 100% at the discretion of the company. What you're talking about the intellectual property rights is absolutely illegal to use that to for fraudulent purposes, but it is an uphill battle to prove that because you have to basically go through the court system yeah, yeah. to get them to reveal enough information. Sometimes yeah. the, the judge might you know look at things discretionary, so it's not revealed to and the that's public. A that's a policy fault of the system. And, and, and we can yeah. you can work through a system to make it better, so to to uh, uh, make that apparent. But the, but the broader, yeah, yeah, the broader question is a policy question because you're saying that it's illegal, but maybe you well, know, we really should to obfuscate be. for the purposes of you know hiding their failures, like like Twitter doing with Elon Musk yeah. recently. That is illegal. You kind of have to. It's a uphill battle to prove that is right now illegal. But if it if they're not doing anything illegal, then to protect their proprietary rights, how they're collecting data, how they're using it, is technically illegal and constitutional. And again, it. Most people have trouble understanding metadata. When you are out there on the public street, nothing you say in the public can be considered personal and private. That is because you are speaking in public. So anyone who records that information can take that information as being publicly available and use it however they see fit. That does not fall within the uh, you know Fourth Amendment rights of you know basically protect it, uh, uh, unauthorized search and seizure. Any company collecting that can use metadata however they see fit. Um, a lot of the uh, confusion with cell phones. There's a lot of stuff with, with cell phones that's confusing. If I talk to you on a cell phone, our conversation on that cell phone can be personal and private. However, my 10-digit number calling your 10-digit number is 100% the pro the recording of that is 100% the property of the cell phone company because we are leasing our numbers. We don't own our numbers. We don't understand, uh, you know, own the data set that says when we called each other. And that's the sort of information most people, you know, jump up and down. Oh, it's a private conversation. That's not what information is being, you know, provided to the government. Okay, we have additional questions. I actually have one. Um, you said that these mics are hot 24-7? Yeah. Right? And they're, they're recording. Right, so you have a hot mic recording 24-7. So you have a grandma and her grandson sitting on the front porch having a conversation about something, and the grandson says something that could be misconstrued at a later date. Well, obviously, if they're on the street corner, again, nobody owns that data, right? But what if, were they recording on private property? And what if, are they recording vocals as well as gunshots? Or is well, I mean, it certainly decibel? can pick up a conversation that, that kind of drifted off of private property because, you know, you've got a public utility pole. It's on the right of way that's only three feet wide or something like that. And then there's private property right behind it. So you pick up something, somebody on their porch. Yeah. I mean, that that's going to happen. They also aren't only installed in uh, public utility poles. They're also installed on private property. Uh, so ShotSpotter has reached out to them. Yeah, they, they they've cut deals with, with, yeah. they've cut so, deals with third parties to install yeah. it on private property. And, and to help with that. So that is a, pri a conversation on personal property. They're based on the, the circumstance she said. That is, there is an expectation of privacy. Now, what happens, again, so... As the NSA, what happens, is, you know, or any other, or the FBI, or anybody else, you have what you're collecting. You will and potentially collect information that you're not looking for. Classic example is a satellite. Satellites have massive footprints. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go with the next question. Sorry. Thank you. Okay. I realize you're looking at the uh, immediate close-up view of something, but I would like to ask a long view question on this. And the question is. This tied with things like flock and ring cameras, is this putting this country on the path to like the Chinese credit system and public surveillance? Yeah, I, I mean, I think if we sit back and do nothing, yeah, we're on the path. How far we go down the path, I don't know. But, you know, we have, we, I think this is part of a, a bigger conversation that we're having the day about our democracy in crisis. You may or may not believe that it's in crisis, but I think a lot of the, our, you know, we, we make a lot of, um, of of what we feel like our values are, but when the rubber hits the road, I mean, we have to really stand behind those values. And so it's up to everyone here to express your opinion to your elected officials and, and also to maybe connect with 
organizations um, like Electronic Frontier Georgia uh, or other organizations, uh, Lucy Parsons Labs, that, that have some experience in how to be truly effective in, in, in fighting, uh, you know, fighting things that are unjust and, and undemocratic. So, um, yeah, I think we, we probably are down on a path, but it's not the first time that we have been before. I mean, uh, you look at the Red Scare, you look at other times in this country when, we, when we've been scared of, out of our own values, and I think we're heading back down that path. So it's up to all of us to, to stand up and say we need to stand up for our values, we need to practice what we say, what we claim to believe in. Hi. Um, after the disclosures of Edward Snowden, NSO Group, and others, as engineers, technologists, I think most people would agree with you. However, the general public, we're not a representative sample of. What do we actually do to make the general public give a shit? Yeah. What do we need to actually make them care? Because as of right now, they don't. And because they don't care, we won't have any change. I would have so how do we actually get them on board? We've been talking a lot to our elected officials about this, and we're realizing more and more that we need to get out and talk to the general public, which is part of why we're here today. And I know that this is not the most representative sample of the average person on the street. Um, uh, it's one of the reasons why I like doing this track in uh, science fiction convention because you have more technological awareness, but it's also you know not the average person on the street, but definitely the entire movement, um, Electronic Frontier Storage, including, we need to get the word out more to the person on the average person on the street. I've been uh, wanting to put together um, but basically a kind of a suitcase presentation on talking about the problems with shot spotters specifically so that I could go around to the neighborhood planning units which are our neighborhood groups in Atlanta and kind of um, explain to people and kind of see what kind of reaction I get you know do are people hostile to the message are they sympathetic what are we going to get back but what we really got to take the I think that the time for just talking to our elected officials maybe that time is here, but we need to do more. It's not enough anymore. We need to take this message to the street, take it to the average person, find ways to reach people. Um, whatever, you know, I mean, DragonCon is an example, but it's not always the best example. But we need to get this message out there and see how it's being received and, and try to explain the problems. I think that even if you get some hostility back, eventually you start to get through to people. So it's just important to get out there you're going to get some pushback. You're going to be like, well, some people are going to be like, well, isn't this just defund the police? Isn't this this, that, or the other? And you've got to be patient and explain, no, it's it's not this. This is, um, you know, I, I, we got to, uh, just from a, a taxpayer point of view, we need to be getting our money's worth with, with, you know, quality solutions that actually deliver what they promise. And you're not getting that from, from many of these systems, especially not ShotSpotter. At least in Chicago, we've taken a very grassroots approach. Uh, we do a lot of canvassing, a lot of public education events. Uh, because our network is composed of largely grassroots organizations, uh, a lot of us have an active base and constituents that we can reach out to and talk to. Um, and, you know, like what Scott said, it really has involved a lot of that. It's involved a lot of discussion. It's involved a lot of understanding what um, the individuals who live in the community envision their public safety to be, rather than it being imposed on them. Um, and I think it's also just uh, sort of going into the heart of what's needed uh, at the moment right now within community. Um, and, you know, I don't, I don't think I've ever had a conversation uh, in the past, you know, year and a half or so that we've been doing this work where technology has come up even once, but a lot of other things have, uh, like lacking healthcare institutions, you know, like grocery stores, because we have so many fucking food deserts, like um, a lot of things that you need to actually survive uh, initially. Um, yeah. Uh, a couple of things. First, the term you're looking for, I think, is parallel construction. Yes. Okay. Uh, secondly, you said earlier that you might need policy change in order to get private companies' data accessible to the public. Uh, I'm from Missouri. We have our state-level FOIA is called the Sunshine Law, and it has a provision for quasi-governmental bodies. So those are companies that whose primary purpose is to contract with governments and provide what would normally be considered a government service like policing. You can use the Missouri Sunshine Law to get those records, but ours is not litigated very much. So I assume other states also have similar provisions that also may not be litigated. Um, I was curious if you know if courts have relied on allowed shot spatter alerts to be 
the exigent circumstance that allows police to conduct a search. Mm -hmm. They have. Yeah, so we've had a, a really good friend of mine had started referring to ShotSpotter as a probable cause generator for just that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is also part of the reason that, at least for us in communities that have been heavily policed uh, for you know, uh, all of history, <laughs> uh, I think um, we have uh, very big concerns that this is just sort of allowing stopping frisks to reappear in a different name. And how how broad is that area that police then do say stopping frisks in? Yeah. Uh, do you remember what the what the deployment of a shot spot alert? How far that's supposed to reach? I think it's within about a mile from the, yeah. the sound. Yeah, it's yeah. within a mile radius. I, I can anecdotally at least say uh, I've seen a firework <laughs> set them off, and we've just seen police go in the wrong direction completely. Uh, so yeah, there's a pretty large, uh, I guess, a margin of error in terms of what the location is. Hey, Alejandro Scott. Nice to meet you. I'm Jesse. Um, I'm curious if you guys know of, or if ever, maybe if you would imagine it, what a nice technological tool would be to help actually curb gun violence over what we have today with ShotSpotter, because I know we were talking about ShotSpotter being a reactive system, right? But when I think about, okay, well, how would we actually want to prevent gun violence? I think about machine learning, and I immediately just think, this is a terrible idea, right? Because we've got all of these training sets that are just going to be as bad as our society is when it comes to pushing these narratives on sure. these communities. So I'm curious if you guys have I've got out. the perfect idea for um, the technology solution here. Yeah. It's called a, it's, excuse me, it's called a cell phone. <laughs> now, <laughs> yeah, just have a phone that, it's not just about the phone itself, it's about who's holding it. Um, because what, what you're really needing, this is really a human problem, mm -hmm. and you've got to get people out there on the street, yeah. and they've got to be able to communicate with each other face to face. That's hard in a pandemic, I get mm -hmm. it. But um, and, and when they do that, they need a way to, to talk to each other too, and that's where the cell phone comes in. But I think whatever solution that you're going to pro propose, the, the people need to come first, because this is a real human problem. Yeah. And then wrap the technology around that, connect them, with whatever tool you need to connect them with. But I don't think it has to be high tech, sexy, whatever. It doesn't yeah. have to involve blockchain. Just enable example, human people to solve but, human problems. Um, you know, it does, it does have to involve people because this is, crime is a real people problem. You, the, this cell phone isn't gonna walk out on its own and <laughs> steal a muffin from downstairs. Um, it's always, there's always a person in the middle. So, you know, you need to address people problems with people. And that's why I talked about the, clear, the, the Cure Violence Global. Yeah. That's why I talk about Midnight Basketball and, and all these things. These are human solutions. Yeah. And they're not sexy. I, 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 you know, I, I admit, they're not sexy uh, in terms of you know, um, making, the, 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 making the evening news, attracting investors, things like that. But this is, this is what can really work if we really, if we really care, you know, if we have a passion for it, if we really put the effort in. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it's real. This is what we've got to do to really prevent and not not just react, you know. I've always really liked uh, the term uh, data journalist Meredith Broussard uses, uh, techno-chauvinism. It's sort of this tendency to think that all social, well, really any issue can be solved by just technology. Um, it's a, you know, it's not, it's not a good tendency. I call it like the Peter Jennings syndrome. <laughs> you know, he's always on the news saying, thing, saying like, yeah, this is how incredible technology is. It's doing this now and that now. And, um, you know, that doesn't that doesn't really capture the schlock in between yeah. because, you know, technology can be as bad just as bad as any person. So. Yeah, and I, I think it's there are socio-cultural problems that are very unlikely to be solved by just the technical solution, let alone one that's only driven by profit incentive. Um, I mean, again, with this case study on ShotSpotter, I guess, um, if their incentive is to just predict, or not predict, sorry, but to detect a gunshot in a gun crime area or something like that, they don't, they don't really have an yeah, incentive to see it go down. They're not doing <laughs> a good no job. Reason for that. Yeah. yeah. And so, it yeah. needs to be not just about profit, it needs to be about service to humanity. Thank you very much. Appreciate yeah. it. Sure. Uh, I had a question for both of you. Um, if this tech, or do you have a fundamental issue with this technology existing, or just that it's not working well enough? Like, if it, in a perfect world, if it had zero false positives, zero false negatives, always worked perfectly, and were deployed in every part of the city, not just like the neighborhood. Would you both still not like it? That's a that's a big debate that's going on right now. I think there's one camp that thinks that this technology can be fixed, 
um, and another camp that thinks that it will never be fixed and it should just be wiped off the face of the earth. And the, the thing is, if you have a if you have a technology, I mean, if you just have a technology problem, you can address that. But when it goes beyond a technology problem, it becomes an integrity problem. That's a real people problem. So um, you've got to have an organization that's that no matter what their what their um, system is doing, they've got to be committed to integrity and they've got to be committed to public service. And we're seeing organizations out there that just aren't. They're they're just they're just selling schlock. So yeah, I see the time. But um, you know, I, I'd like to. I, I'd like to. You know, there was a time certainly. I'd like to think that this is a fixable problem that that you could create um, a shot spotter, for example, that that does solve all the problems. But I think that if you create the regulatory framework um, to, for them to do the due diligence that they need to do, they need to do a technology review. They need to do a legal review. Um, and they need to to um, Pulp, they need to, to publish what they're doing for for, um, for public review, and they need to respond to FOIAs. And by the time you've done that, you've taken a lot of the profit out of the model. So at some point, I realize that you know I think my idealistic side thinks that that yes, we could we could fix the technology problem. But by the time you've done that, you've taken the profit out of the model, and so what's left? And and uh, you know I realize that that it's more than just uh, a technology issue, it's an integrity issue, and, you, and if you can't address the integrity issue, you're never going to succeed. So, um, I guess what's your perspective on that? Yeah, I, I, I think I can agree with that for the most part, for sure. Um, I love technology. I don't love surveillance. That's That should probably be apparent at this point. Um, I think uh, you need to think of the site of use. You need to think of what the tool is being used for to begin with. Um, and in this sort of case, we have one where, for many of us, uh, we have a tool of surveillance that ends up putting a lot of us behind bars or having worse interactions with police. And I, I don't feasibly see a way to change that tool into something that wouldn't do that. It would just be something entirely different. And I don't really think that there's a way to, you know, like, magically debias this so it stops, like, putting black and brown people in danger. I, I think you just have to look at the history of this country to see that that's never been done before, and I don't think there has been an incentive to do that, or will be until enough people can say we don't want this. Yeah, and other people's people. Yeah, no, for sure, yeah, and other people as well. So we do have a unique um, issue in this sort of case, at least in Chicago. Okay, next question. Uh, more just, uh, to the one point, a technologist as well, but believe in lots of good things, but when we're talking to the civic leaders and everything else, I think a useful correlation would be, certainly if you look back, like I say, at a long history of policing, first it was just one-way dispatch, we can get to the crime or to the report faster, you know, that'll have to eliminate our crime, then we have two-way radios and cars, and cops can get there faster, did that substantially reduce all of those problems? you know, to the red light ticket cameras, how many false positives. So you have lots of things that you can draw on that say, um, you know, hey, this is where we put money in and we expected this great result and we were going to get rid of 80% of our problem or at least, you know, the, the easy stuff to get and you didn't even get 20% of that. So wasn't, there was a study I on think the you can kind of profile some of that stuff. On the effectiveness of shot spotter, right? Yeah. yeah. And they basically said that there's, there's no real legitimate benefit from it. No. Um, it's, it's just a, it's like a rounding error. Yeah, at least in Chicago, the Office of the Inspector General uh, did its own independent investigation and also told the city that there was no reasonable benefit for having shots fired. <laughs> Any other questions? It's not really a question, but to, I'm actually in law enforcement. I'm a dispatcher, so I've used shot spotter. And just to give you an idea, when you get it, it's an app on your desktop. And you get an alert, it sends you an email, they give you a lot of things to let you know. And you have dispatch and you have respond, two different versions. And with the one, you just get, you know, a text about what came in on the map where it's showing how many shots and coordinates. And on the other, you can actually listen to it. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure how they can make up how many they get because you listen to it and most of them are fireworks <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's usually fireworks or cars 
got a lot of false alarms, but there mm -hmm. was a Sylvan Simmons case where um, this is in Rochester, New York, and the system recorded a certain number of gunshots, and that they they came that the police came back in in Rochester and demanded that ShotSpotter increase the number of shot of, of gunshots. Um, so what's happening is that there's this manual review on all the activations of the system, and um, and, and this really, uh, at the end of the day, it kind of breaks the chain of, of evidential custody. So, you know, you've got this notion of chain of custody mm -hmm. in the legal system. And um, basically that's so that evidence remains unchanged as it passes from hand to hand. Unfortunately, this practice of, of reinterpreting the, the sound um, uh, based on, you know, they have human operators that do that. And they will also take input from the police departments and and kind of change the evidence to match the story. And that's just troubling from a legal point of view. That that breaks the chain of custody. And you're at the point where any good defense attorney is going to find out about it with this system and going to even they're going to get even factual information thrown out because they know that this has happened. If it's happened at least once, at least twice, then it brings all of this information into doubt, even when it's completely accurate. So that, that it undermines trust in the system, and rightfully so it should. Um, I'm not saying anything against uh, what you do for a living, or how you've done your job in the past, but... but there are a lot of bad ones. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, it's... I mean, you know that you probably know that there's a lot of uh, false alerts. <laughs> and, um, well, because we can listen to them. So you get, you get the recording when it comes in. So you can hear what it's hearing, and it's just, you hear just Yeah, the and shots. then you know that you could listen in on a conversation as well if somebody was standing right under the microphone. Not through our system, not through, not, not with, okay. not with shots. So you're not able to hear that? No, you get the, as what it has that goes in, it comes in, it hears like pop, pop, pop. It will send you that time frame that that's coming in, and you can listen to that, and it tells you where it's hearing this. Okay. And it gives you two, so you have two different screens. You have dispatch and you have response. So if you're doing the response version or the dispatch version, that's giving you just the text. But if you have respond, which I have both, because I do both, the respond, you can listen to it. So those are the ones that are typing it in and telling you what they're hearing and everything. Dispatch is just rotating okay. it already. So my understanding was that if you wanted to go back and listen to the whole recording, including context around it that might be not just gunshots, that you would have to go back in time. Is that correct? It just gives you the clip of when it hears it. So does it trim it? Yeah. It? Okay. It's so not, it trims it's not it even... Okay. It's probably captured, but with when it's provided to the telco, yeah. we, were, just that we had heard that it was captured, so we thought there right. was a way that you can go back in the system. I mean, if there's, if something, the if there's something that ShotSpotter right. itself has, yeah. possibly. Yeah, yeah. 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 they yeah. probably had yeah. But yeah. what they send you, what they send to the police agency. The initial agency, alert is just the, the right. sound They send the, the police agency, and what we're actually listening to is the clip with, the, with what they think is shots. And we treat all of them as if they are shots because we have don't to. know. I mean, I think even you have when we to, listen that's to part it. of the problem. Yeah, even when we listen to it, like we, you know, have time where it's going to be fireworks. And then sometimes, you know, it's say fireworks and they say we found shell casings. My agency, we never care unless we find shell casings because otherwise it's like, it's probably fireworks. Once but if, find if shell you send somebody out on a call, I presume you have to send them yeah, as if. It's a shots fired call, which is yeah, in a high its, state of readiness. It gets it's it's not like really high for us, but we're not Chicago. Chicago has a lot of issues. <laughs> like with, and my teacher used to, my sister used to be a teacher there, and she came from being a teacher in Florida to going to Chicago, and she's like, they are a mess. Oh, we sure, we sure. Yeah. Are. Yeah. <laughs> totally. She's like, their whole like application system even is a mess. But yeah, just so when you, the police agencies themselves, we just get the clip from. Okay. What they're actually hearing. And that's what you can FOIA, is you can FOIA the call that comes mm -hmm. in, in those records and response times. Yeah. Okay, well, we're getting a little bit long on time, so, um, so go ahead and wrap it up here. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. <laughs>